man quits his job to become an F-rank adventurer and an unstoppable force. If you dig my recaps don't forget to subscribe and smash that notification bell. Around a gloomy castle a man is violently thrown to the ground, and already exhausted he breathlessly states that this is his end. Surrounding him a group of hidden beings remarks that the man has become extremely strong, but the guy insists it's not enough. They say we should pursue our dreams while we are still young, especially for adventurers since the tool of their trade is their own body. However there are adults who simply cannot let go of what they desire. At the local adventurers guild it's the day for the selection of candidates who who wish to be promoted to rank E. One of them named Rick shows up for the test and the receptionist Alisa gets excited upon recognizing her old friend. They work together in an office, but the guy left shortly after. But the most surprising thing was that he registered with the guild. Rick comments that it's indeed uncommon to start being an adventurer at 30 years old because most people begin as apprentices at rank F when they are still teenagers. By the way Alisa asks what he's been doing all this time and he says he spent these years training in the mountains with some more experienced companions. Suddenly a drunk interrupts the conversation and asks if the pretty girl there is free to hang out to which she awkwardly replies that she's working. The drunk continues to insist to the point of grabbing her wrist and saying that women should obey men. To resolve the situation Rick wraps his arm around the guy's shoulder and gives a light slap to his stomach. The man trembles due to the excess alcohol and faints. Finding it amusing Elisa hands the guy the card for the rank E test. Upon reading the registration number 79, he starts the day already feeling nervous. Outside a woman named Rianette asks Rick if he has already registered, and he says after raising his eyes a bit more that he's set to take the test alongside those radiant and voluminous youngsters. Rianette asks if that's a reason to look at her front, but the guy pretends she's imagining things. Inside the guild adventurers notice the handprint on the drunk's steel armor. While authorities approach and recognize Gommel the Wild Knight, a former rank A adventurer wanted for assault. Alisa reflects on how Rick handled the guy and wonders if it was he who caused it. Later during the medical exam for the selection, the evaluators measure the height of candidate number 79 and are surprised to note that the man is already 32 years old, leaving Rick embarrassed as always. Next it's time for the measurement of magical energy by touching the sphere. When the third candidate discovers it is C+, everyone around is impressed until Rick Rick is called. After some anticipation the sphere makes a pathetic crackling sound and evaluates the adventurer as F causing the surrounding candidates to laugh, having never seen someone with such low magical energy. Curiously after Rick's departure the sphere cracks. Then begins the brute strength test where the candidates must direct all their strength in a single blow. The slime sack absorbs any type of attack so people don't need to hold back. Upon hearing this Rick remembers the mountain training where his tutor taught that no matter the magic or weapon you are using the body will always be the foundation of everything. Therefore, if a man can destroy this golden slime sack with his bare hands, he will know he has built a body he can trust. Rick argues that he is not capable of destroying something so resistant, but the instructor explains that this is just the basics then easily destroys the sack and claims to be able to do it with 200 of these at once. With that said, Rick began his training on the golden slime with 50,000 punches a day feeling the hell of that time on his skin. Soon the test begins and the first candidate impresses by using strengthening magic in a kick. The second was a smug and vain duke's son said to be only 11 years old with magic equivalent to rank C a typical child prodigy. So the boy goes on to conjure a magic by reciting an entire poem. With great energy emanating around his body, he casts the third nature composite magic flame elimination. Thus a ridiculous fireball zigzags towards the sack and dissipates into it. The evaluator is impressed with the young man's genius while Rick remembers that he also had lessons in third nature composite heat magic. At the time, the instructor threw a fireball capable of ruining an entire mountain. After other candidates have their turn, candidate number 79 is called for the test. Before starting, one of the evaluators notes that Rick cannot expect much growth in his magic at this age because the correct thing is to start practicing from a young age. The evaluators can 
conclusion is that Rick should give up. Feeling the pressure of the surrounding gazes he knows he should do exactly that but still his internal flame burns brighter than ever. One day while training punches on the slime sack despite his fists bleeding absurdly, he still had 30,000 punches to meet the day's goal so the teacher recommended that he stop but he continued until the end. In the end he knows well that he started much later than the others but his belief that he can make up for lost time is greater than anything. With this sentiment he delivers a punch that devastates the slime sack. The brat duke's son grumbles that the guy is stealing the attention that should be his but he assures he will get back at him in the defensive magic test which is his specialty. Later in the defensive magic test Rick manages to defend against a fourth nature composite magic that the kid couldn't and by this point everyone was gaping at candidate number 79. With that done the evaluator announces that he will raise the level and use the fifth nature composite. However the guy explains that he can only go up to the first nature composite so the instructor believes he is being underestimated and intends not to hold back in this next attack. Soon he conjures a shock cyclone, a level 5 spell leaving the other adventurers in disbelief at the outcome. Sylvester Elsernia, a first class knight of the kingdom, hears the explosion from afar and goes to investigate as such a large blast shouldn't be part of a test. Upon learning what happened Lord Sylvester thinks someone is playing a joke on him because no F-rank individual should be capable of what was reported. He then reads the profile of candidate 79 Rick Gladiator aged 32 and is astonished at the man's age. According to the records Rick worked for 14 years as a receptionist at the Tiger Road Cinquat Guild branch. After the defensive magic test the protagonist completed the written exam and finished the tests for the day. Later talking with Rionette he confesses that he doesn't know if he did well on the first day especially since he scored an F in magical capacity. As a consolation Rionette notes that the young young man has improved a lot over the past two years. Suddenly a haughty duke's son appears calling Rick a commoner. Rick tries to remember the boy's name but fails. Furious the kid says his name is Freed Diamuit so Rick asks if he needs help finding his parents. Even more upset Freed cries saying today was supposed to be his day to shine but the old man stole his spotlight in the test. Right behind the boy Angelica, his older sister scolds Rick for making her little brother cry. In tears Freed claims the 40-year-old man mistreated him so Rick tries in vain to convince them that he's in his early 30s. Ignoring everything Angelica challenges the man to a duel throwing a glove at his chest. He picks it up and says that while a noble's daughter might not know doing laundry is hard work. As he picks the glove off the ground Rionette informs him that this gesture symbolizes accepting the duel leaving the poor guy with no way out. Without delay Angelica Diamuit a second class knight of the kingdom's knights drags the the opponent to the arena to punish the supposedly 40-year-old rascal as she puts it. Following Philheim tradition Angelica proposes that the loser must serve the winner until death. Amidst this Rick asks what the level of the challenger might be and Rionette believes that a second-class knight of the kingdom is probably rank B so she asks the young man to go easy on her. Confused Rick reminds her that he's the rank F in this story. To reassure him the woman asks him to remember what he trained for in the past years but the memories make him even more anxious. As a last resort Rionette reminds the man that he's part of the Orichalcum Fist, the group that prides itself on being the strongest on the continent. With that said Rick Gladiator stands up again and heads towards the challenger. Full of herself Angelica claims she'll go easy on the rookie drawing her sword and casting a spell. Rick analyzed that she's the type of swordsman who strengthens the body and weapons, but she doesn't give him time to delve deeper into his study, using her instant step ability to pass by him with impressive speed, making him hear the blade close to his ear. She claims to have given a warning strike, but even reducing her speed the rank F couldn't dodge. Laughing at the old man Freed reveals that his sister is so fast she's known throughout the kingdom as Angelica the Flash. Then she warns that this time she won't miss on purpose and attacks again with instant step. Ironically, as the attacker approached Rick noticed that she's extremely slow easily dodging her without any effort. Jaw-dropping Angelica thought that 
only a few first-class knights could react in time to this kind of attack, but believes it was pure luck, so she charges at the opponent again. Once more Rick can't understand how this woman can be so slow with a nickname like that considering she must be just a rich daddy's girl who became a knight because of her wealthy father. Suddenly she trips over a stone on the way spinning through the air until she plants her sword into the wall with force. Not having anticipated her attack Rick thinks that ability is incredible putting his tail between his legs again, not knowing she nearly tripped and lost her momentum. Angelica doesn't want to lose her composure, either so she pretends she spun on purpose. Next she announces she'll use an ultimate level instant step, a move that impacts her body so much she can only use it three times. Rick acknowledges that she's much faster now yet still seems like a turtle with a cramp. Despite the failure of this attack Angelica insists on the same tactic and repeats the move leaving only one more chance with this ability. Persistently, she maintains the strategy until she trips over another stone along the way. Afraid he won't be able to react in time to this change, of course Rick strikes the ground isolating the opponent and creating a crater in the soil. Unable to believe what's happening Angelica asks who this guy is, and he responds that he quit his job a few years ago to try becoming an adventurer, but he will give his all to pursue this career. With that to the rookie's surprise the knight surrenders using the excuse that she'll let this one slide because he managed to avoid her attacks. Not being a fool Rick Gladiator asks about the agreement that the loser would become the servant and Angelica uses the greatest speed ever recorded by her to flee the scene. After the victory Rionette informs Rick that Bruffston and the others are coming to the kingdom at this moment to see how he's doing and Rick has only bad premonitions about it. In the next scene, the legend of the warrior who faced the supreme monster Kaiser Alcipiate to conquer a treasure capable of granting any wish called the Akashic Records is told. However this warrior never managed to defeat that mythical creature and only some child who dreams of being an adventurer will someday obtain this treasure. This is what the legendary warrior believes. Back in the current kingdom of Filheim, the results of the preliminary tests for rank E are about to be announced, and if the magical energy transmitted to each exam card is blue then that candidate has passed. Tomorrow all the approved candidates will participate in a simulated battle in the second stage of the exam. Next to Rionette Rick Gladiator is tense as another failure could mean his definitive withdrawal given that he is already past the usual age for this. Soon his card begins to glow and fluctuates from blue to red before finally confirming his approval. Upon leaving the room Rick smells something awful until a young charmer throws his charm at the beautiful maiden in the room according to his words. He emphasizes that the noble house of Diamuit governs the people from north to south and he is the eldest son Raster Diamuit. The nobleman asks the maiden's name, and she responds that she is Rionette Erfeld. Rick also introduces himself, but the nobleman makes it clear that he doesn't care about a middle-aged, lackluster fool. Raster then turns his attention back to the elf and says he lost his heart in the depths of her eyes so he would like to take her to the northern lands to make her his second wife. As the young man was rubbing the elf's hand Rick decided to interfere to prevent things from going south for him, so he says that he is the lady's boyfriend and cannot allow such flirtation in front of him. Not believing him Raster despises Rick's rank F card to which the protagonist retorts that the nobleman is also no longer a kid to be taking the rank E exam. However this was the perfect cue for the heir to boast that he passed this level at only 14 years old. In fact he belongs to rank M and is the examiner of the simulated battle. Full of himself he shows his credentials and advises Rionette to leave this loser and dine with a real adventurer. The elf laments disappointing the nobleman, but as can be seen she is in the company of this gentleman. Additionally, she comments that the smell of Raster's cologne is so strong that it causes discomfort. Outraged the heir of House Diamuit calls Rick a fifth-rate trash and tells him to prepare for the simulated battle as there he will show the difference between them and knock some sense into the elf's head. After Raster leaves Rick takes the opportunity to apologize to Rionette for saying she is his girlfriend, but she confesses that the story made her happy and besides it resolved the problem. Back at his palace, the heir drowns his sorrows in drink while cursing that guy's life. Suddenly his brothers come to him in tears complaining that a 30-year-old commoner made fun of them during the first test. According to the eldest, no one is allowed to make two members of House Diamuid cry, so he promises to make the criminal pay. Given that they said the man was old Older Rick comes to Raster's mind who asks his brothers if they remember the man's registration number. Freed 
only recalls that the number seemed to say the guy was going to die, so the heir laughs upon discovering who it is. A few days later the time for the simulated battle had arrived and Rionette asks Rick to go easy on people. He replies that he isn't even capable of going hard unlike that northern playboy who will end him in this test. Certain that he would be beaten the young man begins to cry until a man in front of him introduces himself as Lynx Lorot and states that he will be Gladiator's examiner in the battle, as he will be responsible for numbers 50 to 100. With that said Rick celebrates upon realizing that his registration number 79 wasn't as unlucky as he thought. As if that weren't enough Lynx praises the candidate saying that the fact he is 30 years old and quit his job to become an adventurer has restored hope for the man who one day wants to be like Rick. Lynx started as an adventurer at 24 and only got his career going after 30. Therefore he sees Rick Gladiator as an example of determination. Now 40 years old the examiner intends to fulfill his dream of reaching rank, although it took him almost 20 years to reach B. With that Rick enthusiastically greets the man, and although Lynx emphasizes that he will not have a favorite candidate in the exam, he invites Gladiator for a drink after the test. Listening to every word from his hiding spot, Raster waits for the examiner to pass by to approach him. After this conversation Rick seems much more relaxed for the battle, as a huge weight has been lifted off his shoulders. However one of the organizers enters the concentration room and informs that Lynx Lorat the examiner for candidates 50 to 100 has suddenly fallen ill. Given the situation Raster Diamuet will take over these candidates. Rionette had already suspected there would be some problem considering that Rick ended up crossing paths with the three Diamuet sons. Around him an adventurer laments Raster being the examiner because he is known as the man of a thousand skills, a genius who rose to rank a at just 17 years old. As if that weren't enough he has another nickname that's even worse the rank F crusher. And they say he harasses candidates every year for pure entertainment. Meanwhile preparing for the simulated battle raster begins to show his claws by defeating a candidate with just one spell. According to him, this is the problem with people of humble origins they aren't even good for a warm-up. Behind him an elite guard receives the signal. Desperate Rick Gladiator asks what to do now despite Rionette, not understanding the reason for all the drama. The man remembers that the examiner is a rank A who hates him not to mention all the people who always said he would fail. So Rionette responds that since other people's words can give or take away the confidence of those who hear them she says that Rick is a strong man capable of passing the test and defeating the playboy with the spoiled perfume. Ever since Rick decided to become an adventurer all he's done is succeed. Hearing these words he feels more motivated to continue his journey without much regret. That is until a hooded kid approaches him and asks to read his fortune for free saying he saw in Rick a man fighting his own demons who needs some clairvoyance. With nothing better to do the protagonist accepts the challenge and sits in the chair. As he does he falls into a magical trap and vanishes. The kid then removes his hood revealing himself to be freed Diamuet. Rionet Furious cuts the kid's crystal ball in half blows up the wall behind him in the process and grabs freed by the collar to find out where the adventurer has been sent. When he refuses to cooperate she cuts half of his eyelashes and warns that next time it will be his eyes. Freed panics and admits it's a teleportation spell that reaches 90 yards meaning the old man isn't far. Rick ends up behind the test area where he's greeted by an elite guard and his cronies. Realizing this the rank F adventurer discovers he is indeed being sabotaged by the Diamuet family. The strength of the men surrounding him is equivalent to rank B meaning he's about to take a big beating and miss the exam. To make matters worse the leader of the elite guards can take on rank of warriors. Rick's fate seems sealed, but the Orichalcum fist appears on the hill before the worst happens. The boss reminds Rick he has a test and asks what the hell he's doing there. The henchmen can't believe they're facing a talking orc. Rick stammers before making up that these men around him are helping him warm up for the simulated battle, so the orc offers to help too. In despair Rick tells the elite guards to run for their lives, but they don't feel threatened. One of them strikes the orc's head with a hammer which crumbles without causing any damage. Not satisfied the man attacks the orc's arm so the orc breaks his wrist. To everyone's surprise the monster heals his attacker's hand and explains that there's a lack of balance in weight compensation for a stronger punch as the body is a completely connected mass that can't be ignored. Hearing these words the elite guard's leader realizes who these people are. Meanwhile the Orichalcum fist boy pulls out his 
his super cannon called Revised Juliet loaded with magic stones and lead bullets and announces he'll resolve the conflict peacefully. Then he attacks three enemies in front of him, leaving Rick stunned. Lastly, the guards take the Orichalcum girl hostage and order everyone to surrender or they'll slit her throat. Rick and the orc warn the man to let her go before something worse happens, and the girl asks her friends what the guy behind her is doing. Rick explains to Elisaret that the man is just trying to play so she asks what kind of game it is. The guard losing patience punches her to keep her quiet, which awakens the child's fury destroying everything around her with seventh nature composite magic. The guard's leader bows his head and explains that this girl is only 10 years old but is the most powerful vampire mage. After all, she's the demon child of devastation Elisaret Dracul. As for the other member who looks like a boy his appearance is deceiving he's a half-elf half-dwarf over 50 years old with techniques, a millennium ahead of his time being the greatest weaponsmith in the world. His name is Mizet Eldwarf known as the Millennial Workshop. Lastly the orc possesses unparalleled physical strength and his intelligence is equally impressive. Able to use all existing support spells, this is Bruffston Ashork the Wise Beast. According to the guard leader, the three are rank S adventurers and make up the continent's most legendary group, the legendary Orichalcum Fist. For the first time in his life, the old man saw these three with his own eyes, so he drops his weapons and declares he will retire to live the rest of his life in peace. With that said, Elisaret annihilates the remaining guards, while Rick celebrates his chance to take the test. Back with Rionette, the adventurer surprises Freed, who thought the old man was as good as dead, and the elf gets rid of him ruthlessly. Then Lynx appears injured and reports that Raster did this to him. As if that weren't enough before giving the examiner a beating the air asked what his dream was. Coming from humble beginnings Lynx came from a place where kids want to be adventurers but have no opportunities, so his dream is to open a school for them. Hearing this Raster locked Lynx up and scorned his attempt to educate societies, Scum saying a third-rate teacher will produce students just as rotten. Lynx was furious at this insult, but couldn't respond to the noble. Thinking about this, the examiner asks Rick to give up the exam, not knowing what he's getting into but Rick has no intention of giving up. Returning to the arena Raster sees one of his guards fall unconscious so he deduces that Rick Gladiator is on his way. The noble would love to crush that man's dreams without even allowing him to try, but since he'll have the displeasure of a direct clash, he wonders if he can make rank F suffer in another way like making hell seem like a playground for that guy. While waiting for that moment to arrive the noble entertains himself by setting fire to the poor souls during the preparation for the grand event. Amidst all this Adolf observed the training not expecting much from a rank A. By breaking the fourth wall, he directly teaches us that the four great fundamentals of every adventurer are physical strength body control mana quantity and magical control. Together these stats dictate the power of the person who possesses them. Arnold has the innate ability to visualize the scores of these fundamentals in other people. To prove his point he compares the status difference between one of the event participants and Raster who has such an overwhelming amount of mana that it even hurts the young man's eyes. Looking around with his impaired vision, he sees Rick and can't understand what an old man is doing in a test for kids. However, upon analyzing the stats of the man, Arnold's eyes burn more than ever. Upon arriving at the arena, Rionette is approached by the Adventurer's Guild receptionist Alice Granger, who tries to strike up a conversation with the elf for some reason. In a corner of the bleachers, Elisaret calls her friend to watch the event near the Orichalcum Fist. Alice is dumbfounded to see an orc in the arena, while Rionette refuses Mizet's proposal to sit near him to avoid being a victim of the elf dwarf's hand. Since it didn't work out with his friend, he tries his luck with Rick Gladiator's former co-worker, as she has a pleasant and swaying heart. The elf warns that the guy is not to be trusted, then pushes the human to another corner. Bruffston asks how the promising rookie of their group is doing and Rionette informs that Rick will pass this test without major problems. Alice warns that the examiner for this test is a rank A who always overdoes it when dealing with rookies, but even so the orc doesn't think it's a problem. On the other side of the arena Angelica eggs her brother on to beat up that idiot who looks 40 until she sees her youngest getting beaten up and arriving beside her. Facing Rick Gladiator Raster confesses that he was surprised to see the rookie escape his guards, but he didn't expect much from insignificant plebeians like them. Now the old man will face the the creme de la creme of the kingdom of Filheim, the self-proclaimed genius Raster Diarmuet.
After feeling something strange in his body Rick questions why the noble became an adventurer, and he responds that he has the talent for it, and that it further boosts his status even though he is an heir. Indignant at the opponent's lack of honor Rick asserts that he won't allow himself to be defeated by a guy like this. Raster warns that talk is cheap and proves his point by invoking a first nature composite magic the ice shot. Throwing the icy spear near the protagonist's face Raster thinks the guy froze in fear and couldn't dodge but in reality Rick was just staying calm in the face of the challenge just as Rianette asked him to do before entering the fight. Being honest with himself he is worried but is striving to follow the elf's directive. On the other hand since Rick didn't react the noble claims he will do as he pleases. Around him his siblings shout for the eldest to finish off the guy so Raster invokes a third nature composite magic the illuminated flame leaving Rick surprised that the opponent didn't use an incantation for a spell of that level. Despite the roar of the flames gladiator remains static in the face of the fire magic. Bruffston comments that it was so insignificant that it can't even be classified as an attack against his pupil. Seeing Alice worried he asks if she knows what the four fundamentals are and she accurately names them all. Bruffston explains that among them the mana quantity should be developed when young roughly until the age of 20. Since Rick started this life at 30, the only thing he can rely on is his own body. For this reason the orc applied specific training to the student aiming at this characteristic placing weights for him to walk and get physically stronger to compensate for the lack of mana. Meanwhile Raster conjures the cutting hurricane of fourth nature composite magic and throws it at the examinee. Bruffston explains that he taught Rick to develop this body from scratch while Mizid was responsible for teaching magical control. Elisaret says she just played magic games with Rick sometimes. Lastly Rionette trained the pupil's body control. By dedicating himself so much to the activities he practiced with the Orichalcum Fist Gladiator reached the level of an S rank just like the other members of this organization. At that moment Raster launches his shock burn still using fourth nature. Rionette observes that Rick himself doesn't realize the level he has reached because Bruffston made sure to keep the students feet on the ground like the day the boy couldn't break a rock in half the orc said even a rank F could do it. In the midst of this Raster continued applying his sorcery to the candidate with ferocity, despising the third-rate scum that dares to challenge nobility. With all his hatred for the rabble, the rich guy unleashes so many spells that the dust from the explosions fills the arena. Ironically, he admits he went a bit overboard. Regardless, none of this had any effect on Rick, who reappears without significant damage further irritating the examiner. Consequently, Raster raises the level of the challenge by using physical fortification that boosts his strength and speed. Once again Rick repels the adversary as if he were an insect, then reflects that he understood Rionette's point about self-control and perseverance. Focusing only on his innate talent Raster neglected his own development making him extremely careless despite the enormous amount of mana. With this realization in mind, the rookie declares he will not lose this fight. Even though the situation is not as favorable as imagined Raster continues to believe that the candidate got away just by luck. So he begins to cast his first enchantment spell cheering on his siblings in the stands. Using a third composite nature spell flame elimination Raster hurls a vast layer of flames at his opponent who easily blocks the attack. This time Raster can't hide his look of surprise. Mizet explains that Rick used his magic with a high degree of precision to block, because having low mana doesn't mean you can't compensate with excellent self-control. Despite his arrogance Raster accuses the opponent of being cocky claiming that all his blocks were pure coincidence. Still confident in his superiority Raster is forced to use his iron body to take the student's blow fearing an early demise. Indignant Angelica comments that her brother is losing to a guy who hasn't even used any physical enhancement. At the same time Raster finally admits that this guy is stronger than a rank E, but insists that Rick only dodged the attacks by pure luck. Tired of the noble's arrogance, Rick emphasizes the effort it takes for someone not to recognize the opponent's strength, especially since he didn't use any magic in the fight, only his body control. Still skeptical, Raster asks how this guy got so strong in just two years considering he's old. Hearing this question from a spoiled rich kid who always had all the opportunities life could offer Rick feels personally offended. He had endured training where he was trapped inside a dragon's lair, 
until the creature was dead and swam in monster capture fluid until he drowned. Alice asks what this story is about and Bruffston confirms that the guy not only drowned, but also died a few other times. However, the orc's healing ability is powerful enough to bring someone back to life if they've just died. This is one reason why Rick is so powerful. After all, he could come back from the dead to continue his body reconstruction training a regimen not just anyone could undertake. Whether thrown into a precipice or hit by a city-sized rock Rick could come back to life and continue his training. Raster claims this is all lies because even if such a harsh realm existed Rick would never have the motivation to go through with it. On the other hand, the novice adventurer asserts that he is just like Lynx the examiner Raster injured. Despite their age, both still dream big. Disregarding the usual talk about having dreams, the noble questions what the goal is to which Rick firmly states that he will defeat the world's strongest monster Kaiser Alcipiate. Freed laughs at this, and his older brother follows suit. Alice remembers that this monster appears in the legend of hero Yamato and Bruffston adds that Kaiser is the final goal of the Orichalcum Fist. Raster says this is a childish dream, a fairy tale that never existed, but Rick no longer has patience for the noble's arrogance and ignores him. Faced with this Raster promises to end the fight once and for all. He invokes a seventh composite nature spell called Forest Rope, which restrains Rick's movement. Then he recites his most powerful ability of the eighth nature. As a result, a gigantic wooden golem is created terrifying the event's spectators. Inside the monster's mouth, Raster mocks the adversary's reaction who was summoning an air shot. However, as he emphasizes, Rick points out that his opponent may have trained the technique he's using dozens of times, but he trained this simpler technique a hundred million times. Everyone around thinks this is a lie, but Bruffston explains that it's possible with the use of space-time magic. Anyway, Raster still doesn't believe all this talk and completes the conjuration of his most powerful spell, the Divine Impact Yggdrasil. On the other side, Rick uses the simple air shot of the first composite nature to confront the golem. Fist to fist, they measure strength, but it's the giant golem that suffers the most its structure gradually breaking apart until it explodes from the immense pressure from the opposite side. With that done, Raster falls defeated to the ground and Rick proudly declares that his dream remains intact. After the victory, the Orichalcum Fist praises the pupil's performance who finally understands that he has indeed become extremely powerful, something he didn't know until then. On the defeated side, Raster is consoled by his siblings until he appears before the Orichalcum Fist. Rick takes the opportunity to mock him saying that an elite genius was crushed by a lowly commoner. Freed threatens to grumble, but Angelica tells him to stay put. Then Rick adds that he chose a few techniques to practice exhaustively instead of hundreds of useless powers advising the noble to train a limited number of spells. Unconvinced Raster warns the student that he will be his examiner in the next promotion test and when that happens he will crush the candidate. Finally, he continues to refer to Rick as third rate and tells him to prepare for what's to come. Freed and Angelica run after their injured brother, but the girl pauses for a moment to greet Rick something he never imagined possible. Later, the exam results were about to be announced, and the responsible person calls out the numbers of the promoted candidates one by one. Calmly Rick waits for the numbers to be selected alongside Rianette and other examinees who unlike the protagonist were anxious. Meanwhile Alice eats a meal with the other members of the Orichalcum Fist and asks if it's okay for them to be there before the announcement of those who passed and they all reply that there's no need to worry. Rianette comments that Rick is calmer than she imagined, and he explains that he was just reminiscing about about some things. When he was a child lost in his tales of heroes, Rick read that upon defeating the supreme monster Kaiser Alcipiate one would gain a treasure capable of fulfilling any wish called the Akashic Records. However, Yamato the hero everyone believed could achieve this failed, and stated that only a child dreaming of becoming an adventurer could obtain this treasure and have their wishes granted. Reading this story to his parents, little Rick dreamed of being like Yamato, though his mother thought being an adventurer carried great dangers that could lead anyone to death. In her motherly concern, she wished her son would find another type of work. His father, on the other hand, thought this dream was a childish wish that should be set aside because everyone should seek stable and decent jobs. In school, still a child Rick discovered he had a very rare ability, but the evaluators couldn't say exactly what this power was. The boy wondered if it was the type of power Yamato had, and the evaluator replied that it was something like that. Just this statement was 
was enough to make the boy's eyes shine with enthusiasm, but the evaluator emphasized that this power wouldn't manifest through training, but with time. Therefore, the boy had to be patient. On his way home, Rick could already see himself on par with the great Yamato, and he hoped that when this ability manifested, he could tell his parents and convince them that he had the talent to fulfill his dream of becoming an adventurer. In the following days after telling his closest school friends about this hidden power, everyone eagerly awaited when Rick would awaken his true potential. Showing the typical impatience of a child, his friends would ask day after day if this power had appeared, and with a hopeful smile Rick would say they just had to wait. A year later his friends were still questioning him about this matter, so Rick now, with less joy in his eyes, considered that perhaps the power wouldn't reveal itself until he became an adult. Despite the evaluator saying it was an innate power that would come without training the boy started to push himself trying somehow to express this much talked about ability. Years later already in his adolescence, the situation remained the same. His friends advised that there are cases where a person no matter how much talent they have within them sometimes never manages to manifest it. They asked why Rick didn't become an adventurer in the meantime since many people who choose this profession aren't necessarily strong but still manage to make good money. However, for Rick being an adventurer didn't mean making money. In any case being his age, he needed to find jobs to help at home, so he got a job as a receptionist at a guild called Tiger Road making his parents proud. The following days were an adaptation to the new job where the young man worked hard to fit in and be a worthy employee of the uniform he wore though he felt some jealousy towards the adventurers who passed through. In his free time, he continued practicing trying to manifest the ability he was told he had. But as time passed he grew older and more stuck in this job, while adventurers constantly passed by showing their achievements and telling their journey stories. Even his parents who once had a youthful appearance were now showing gray hairs. Throughout this time the Tiger Road receptionist kept his Legend of Yamato book close though his hope of living the dream died a little each day. One day Rick paid a reward to an adventurer who exterminated a slime infestation with Tuzazanzans and Lukes and was thanked with a thank you uncle. Beside him Alice tried to adapt to the new job and relied on her colleague for most things. Speaking of which he mentioned that monsters expelled from their lairs had been appearing in the city lately indicating a new mission. Most of these monsters were low level so it was likely a rank D mission. In the meantime Zaid proudly appeared at the guild to show off his new achievement achievement, a rank B medal meaning, he could now make a living solely as an adventurer. Impressed Rick congratulated his friend, though his voice carried a hint of sorrow. On the way home the man admitted his frustration at seeing Zaid evolving more and more, while he himself sat in the same chair for 14 years doing the same job as always. At least he had a stable income which was his parents' wish, but it didn't satisfy his need to do something more. In the midst of this reflection Rick heard a girl's screams, so he ran to see what was happening. Along the way a gigantic troll emerged from behind a house, a mid-level monster that didn't usually appear in that place. Suddenly an elf passed by the monster so Rick stepped in front to protect her. Seeing that the boy was full of fear she told him to get out of the way and sliced the troll into pieces effortlessly. She then thanked the human for trying to save her but made it clear he didn't need to worry because she was an adventurer. As the elf spoke the moon appeared through the clouds and shone intensely illuminating the imposing figure of Rianette Elfelt. Walking alongside the elf, the two introduced themselves and Rick thanked her for the help also asking if her rank was B as he had seen her unusual strength. When Rianette said no the man was startled to imagine he was in the presence of a rank A adventurer, but she wasn't part of that category either. In fact showing her metal Rianette proved to be rank S. At this moment Rick almost went crazy because adventurers of this level were removed from the guild's records for being too strong and they could only be supervised by the main office. Having met someone of such a legendary degree, Rick asked if he could ask a strange question, but requested the elf not to laugh. In her defense, she argued she hadn't laughed since she was eight. So Rick proudly declares that his dream is to become an adventurer and defeat Kaiser Alcipia, and that he has an innate ability that has never manifested. He wants to know if he can reach rank S, even though he's starting the profession at 30 years old. Rionette points out that the boy has courage 
which is essential for this field, but she reminds him that mana development happens when one is young which isn't his case. Therefore, she dismisses any possibility of Rick Gladiator succeeding in this profession. Pretending to be okay, Rick feels confused and thanks the elf for freeing him from this youthful dream, but at least he met such a wonderful person whom he would love to go out with any day to eat something. Even though he said it impulsively, Rianette accepts the invitation and arranges to go out with the human the next day. Back at work, the guy was pure motivation with his mood through the roof. Zaid comes asking for his first rank B job and Rick hands it over as if the adventurer were the winner of the neighborhood raffle. After all, the guy is going out with a beautiful girl, which means his life isn't total trash according to his own words. However, his plans fall apart when people start shouting about the appearance of monsters. Worried Rick runs to the meeting place with Rionette but realizes his concern is unfounded because the area around the elf has turned into a cemetery of creatures. As more enemies approached Rionette Elfelt used her cleaving blade ability and made all the monsters into pieces. After exterminating the opponents the elf is overwhelmed by a vision of a hell where she was attacked by the shadows of an evil dragon. This leaves her out of action for now so when another monster appears Zaid shows up to prevent the guild receptionist's death. Besides him other adventurers who usually take jobs on Tiger Road join the adventurer after responding to an emergency guild mission. Together the warriors eliminate the threat making Rick feel a pang of envy seeing what an adventurer can do. Still Rionette having somewhat recovered warns that a dragon is nearby and that this team won't be enough. She knows this because when she feels a dragon's magic she loses control of her own magic. Soon the winged beast appears in the sky so Rick understands the cause of the monster's flight. When the dragon lands and looks directly into one of the adventurer's eyes the man panics and attacks with a burning shock which although it doesn't cause any damage provokes the creature's fury that with a single flap of its wings throws all the humans to the ground. Zaid knows everyone needs to flee as they have no chance against such an enemy. However despite the group's attempts to get away the dragon raises a barrier around and traps everyone close to him. Zaid tries to break the shield with his axe but the magical protection is too strong. Faced with this, the man is sure he's going to die today. However, to everyone's surprise, Rick Gladiator steps in front of the others. Nervously, he explains that if they're all going to die anyway, he'd rather go down fighting to die as an adventurer since he couldn't live as one. Though he had given up on the dream, the truth is Rick's blood still boils inside, and this boiling was more than just the hope of fulfilling his desire. With that in mind, Rick throws a stone at the dragon to vent this feeling, while Zaid rallies his colleagues not to leave the receptionist alone in this. Soon, the fake Chun Lai takes the front line while the mage fires his cutting hurricane. Finally, Zaid takes advantage of the distraction to hit his axe on the monster's snout, but besides having no effect, the dragon now prepares to use its breath. Anticipating this, Zaid covers the entire team with iron body. However, although he saved everyone from becoming toast, the group members suffer the impact damage and lose much of their reaction capability. Even Rionette, a rank snow she can't fight this opponent. Suddenly re-emerging from beneath the dragon's breath, Debris Rick stands in front of everyone once again and approaches the monster until he gets stomped. While the group laments the man's supposed death, he receives the information that he has acquired a new ability. With that, he lifts the dragon's paw by sheer force and exudes such an absurd amount of mana that even Rionette is frightened. With this energetic aura around him, he manages to protect his body from the dragon's breath. To counterattack, Rick Rick uses the awakening of raw courage and launches a ray that opens a gaping hole in the monster's body. After killing the enemy he faints. A week later, he wakes up from a coma with tremendous pain, so Rionette explains that he practically died when his magical circuits were destroyed. The elf patiently waited for Rick to wake up to invite him to join the Orichalcum Fist because their goal is the same as the humans to defeat Kaiser Alcipiate. Since it was a legend few believe to be real Rick widens his eyes at the certainty that it was always true. Besides that the elf points out that Rick showed great talent and growth potential against the dragon which could make him a great ally and above all an excellent adventurer. This was the first time Rick had heard this from someone else, so he can't contain his emotion. Back in the present moment Gladiator hears his number being called on the loudspeaker. Officially promoted he walks alongside Rionette and credits his achievement to his masters and himself who never gave up on becoming an adventurer. Some time later the examiner Lynx Lorat sets out to meet the Orichalcum Fist 
after receiving a map of their location from Gladiator. A few days ago Lynx was recovering from the cowardly beating he took from Raster Diamuet to put him out of commission. The examiner would love to have a drink with Rick as soon as he's discharged as they had planned before the exam. Besides Lynx is very interested in meeting this group Rick hangs out with so he asks for the meeting to be at their residence. Rick warns him first and foremost that the examiner should come with as much equipment as possible because the place is eerie. Following the adventurer's map Lynx arrives at Arcust District Number 13. There stood Castle Weeghale which according to Lynx looked like the Demon Lord's castle. As he approaches he feels intimidated by the massive entrance gate taking a while to notice there's a much smaller door granting access to the interior. Upon ringing the doorbell to call the residence the large gate opens and Rick welcomes the visitor. Inside the daunting wall the place was wonderful and gave a unique sense of peace. No wonder as no monster dares approach the domain of the Orichalcum Fist. Hearing this from Rick Link's questions why he had been asked to wear so much armor to enter if there are no threats around. The adventurer explains it's to keep his friend from ending up in a coffin. Soon they enter the house and are greeted by Rionette. Lynx feels honored by the presence of the elf who helped him so much during his rank promotion exam. Behind Rionette a little girl waves at Rick leaving Lynx puzzled about having a child in this peculiar environment. Nevertheless, he would love for his daughter to grow up as healthy and happy as this girl seems. That said, the child casts a sixth level spell on the visitor simply saying, kaboom and Rick has to save the man's life at the last moment. Obviously, the adventurer scolds a Lyserette, something he's done a thousand times before for the same reason casting spells inside the castle. The vampire complains that Rick doesn't play with her anymore, as if it were his fault. Maintaining her composure, Rionette threatens to deduct from a Lyserette's food allowance to pay for house repairs, prompting the girl to throw herself at the elf's feet begging for mercy. Rick sighs and asks the visitor for a moment to give the child affectionately nicknamed Alice by the residents some attention. Rick knows the little rascal will cause trouble again if left alone. Meanwhile, Rionette makes Lynx feel at home, and the first thing he does is observe the view from one of the windows certain it would take days to explore the entire area. Moreover, he can see Mizet's workshop within his field of vision. Curious, he heads down to the dwarf elf and introduces himself, using his surname Lorot asking about the type of craftsmanship the fellow is engaged in. Mizet explains explains it's an Ultra Flame Cannon number 6 and lets the visitor use the equipment against the Scarecrow in the yard. According to the Dwarf Elf, all you need to do is focus your magic into the weapon and pull the trigger. Doing so, Lynx falls backward from the missile launcher's recoil and creates a crater where the projectile hit. Frightened by the weapon's power, he states that mass production of this armament would forever change the concept of war worldwide. Now returning inside the mansion, he walks more cautiously after nearly dying due to a crazy piece of equipment from a dwarf elf. Peeking into one of the rooms, he sees an orc through the half-open door and is shocked. Without taking his eyes off the book, he's reading Bruffston a shork invites the visitor to enter if he wishes. Embarrassed Lynx apologizes for the inconvenience and approaches the orc impressed by the number of books there. According to the monster, these are his quarters and private library because he feels more at peace when surrounded by books. Despite having read almost all of them lately, the wise beast has been focusing a lot on Rick's training, which takes away some of his reading time. Knowing the orc was responsible for Gladiator's training links, Lorot humbly asks this master to also work on his skills. Bruffston stands up and praises the human's determined look because of its resemblance to his students. Later Rick searches for the guest everywhere until Mizet informs him that the guy entered the forest with Bruffston a while ago. At that moment, the man panics. Being thrown off a cliff tied to two immensely heavy steel balls, Lynx says goodbye to his two daughters Latina and Lilia. However, his fall is cushioned as he lands on some furry creature. Confused, he looks down to see Rionette lifting a giant boar that would serve as an ingredient for dinner. After being saved by the elf, the Philheim examiner thanks her for the help, while she immediately guesses that the weights on the human's feet were put there by Bruffston. According to Lynx, his master ordered him to run down a cliff. Unfazed, Rionette comments that the orc is the one 
who kills Rick the most in training and Lynx pretends he didn't hear that. Behind him Bruffston appears to continue the training and drags the man into the forest. After returning from the exercises Lorot is happy to still be alive just like Rick who didn't have the chance to tell the man that training with the wise beast is a big problem for the unsuspecting. He also tells the guest that certain things the three Orichalcum members say should be completely ignored like when Bruffston claims he'll go easy on training when Alice promises she won't do something again and when Mizet guarantees he'll take something seriously. Speaking of the devil, the three were planted in front of the human complaining about his exaggeration. However, Rick stands firm and maintains his stance trying to keep his guest alive. Mizet asserts that Rick's mistake was precisely inviting this guy for a tour of the mansion, leaving Lynx even more terrified. Later, Rionette serves tea to the two humans and informs them that dinner will be ready shortly. Noticing a vibe between Rick and the elf Lynx asks his friend what's going Going on between them once she leaves. Rick thinks there's nothing special happening especially since he's just a dull 30-year-old guy. However Lynx points out that the age difference shouldn't matter much. For example his wife is 20 years younger than him. Either way he knows that nothing can be forced when it comes to love. At some point if it's meant to be their feelings will align and everything else will fall into place in the blink of an eye. A bit later during dinner Lynx, Lorot expresses gratitude for the meal and Rick insists that his guest eat plenty something Alice has already done, but still finds insufficient. Besides her, the other two Orichalcum members also want to eat or drink more so Rionette gets up to serve everyone. Lynx tells Rick that this is the perfect time to offer to help the elf and strengthen their bond so Rick rushes out to avoid missing the opportunity. Meanwhile, Lynx becomes curious about the gladiator's innate ability and Bruffston explains that Rick can't activate the ability on his own depending on certain factors for it to happen. If the man controls the awakening of brute force, he will certainly be stronger than even the members of the Orichalcum Fist. After Rick returns, the orc takes the opportunity to ask their guest who works at the Central if he has heard of the six gems of the Yamato legend because their goal is to defeat Kaiser Alcipiet. These six gems are magical stones that open the portal to the spiral of origin where Kaiser sleeps. However, these stones are only activated every 200 years, and at this part of the cycle they are already releasing an enormous amount of magic. That said, the Orichalcum members want to know any additional information about this. Lynx doesn't know but promises to check the confidential department to see if he finds anything. After this, Rick whispers to his friend that he didn't find any right moment to help his love interest because the woman is simply perfect in everything and didn't need help with anything. Hours later at the Adventurer's Guild, a woman complains that she's cleaning when she should be continuing her young adventurer career. Soon she sees the Orichalcum Chalcom Fist trying to take on a mission, but they need one more member in the group to have the required minimum number. So the guild master recommends they take Ray Lucas, a young girl who wants to explore the world as an adventurer. She doesn't seem very excited to walk alongside, according to her, a talking orc, a kid, and a tacky old man. However, anything is better than sweeping the floor, so she accepts the challenge and joins the group. On the way, Rick explains that they are looking for a magical stone that is extremely valuable and has the power to attract monsters. Confident in herself, Ray states that she can handle any monster attracted by the stone because she might be rank F now, but soon she'll be at the top. By the way, she asks the man's rank and he says he is rank E. With this answer, Ray concludes that Rick is an old man who started late, so he must be ridiculously weak. Further ahead, Alice and Bruffston find the magical stone behind the hills. Meanwhile, at the mansion, Mizet uses a gadget to blow wind on Rionette's skirt to lift it, so the elf quickly circles around and asks what's going on. He explains that it's a device that creates wind without using magic called the Stormy Macon. Rionette replies that it's quite interesting before destroying the device into pieces with her sword. On the road approaching the magical stones, the group encounters a wyvern and Ray panics. Without losing his composure, Bruffston slowly approaches the dragon and punches it far away. Ray Lucas complains that the wyvern's death will attract several others to the region 
so the orc gets tired of her whining and tells Rick to endure her talk. Later, the man is tasked with being the girl's personal listener until they see dozens of dragons being slaughtered ahead where Bruffston and Alice were killing each one of those winged beasts. However, a red wyvern and even stronger dragon race had circled around and landed in front of the two humans. As usual, Ray gives up on life and sits down so Rick asks her to run. Not wanting to act like a coward, Ray changes her mind and decides to face the wyvern alongside her companions like Yamato would. Being a huge fan of the legendary adventurer, Rick accepts the proposal and asks the girl to provide support. With this, she prepares a first nature composite spell, but Rick jumps ahead and smashes the beast's head with one hand. The next day upon returning to the guild, the girl is acting strange because of everything she witnessed yesterday and the guild master understands why. The Orichalcum Fist is known for bringing trouble wherever they go considering they are the most powerful rankus group on the continent. For this reason, the master believes that Ray Lucas should be content with activities that align with her limitations. However, Ray is motivated to reach the level of those adventurers and do amazing things like they do. Speaking of which, the Orichalcum displays one of the six gems, the Crimson Flower on their table after finding it at the bottom of the wyvern's nest. By using the magic resonance of this stone, they will be able to find the other gems. With this intent, Mizet uses his earth mapping ability, opening a map that points to Herectopia, a country known for its Colosseum, where combat arts make the fame of this nation. 400 years ago, this place was a small country mainly composed of desert. The fourth king, Alexander Herectopia, saw a settlement called Nuclepercy and built the Colosseum there. He held combat competitions and King Alexander himself fought unarmed using only his body becoming an undefeated champion of 10,000 fights. As his fame spread across the continent fighters from all corners challenged the king to break his invincibility while Herectopia thrived as a kingdom of immense prestige and vigor in the face of these displays of strength. Nuclepercy, where the arena was located became the capital of this reign. Alongside the Orichalcum Fist Rick Gladiator stands before the enormous statue of the man known as Alexander the King of Fists. Bruffston would have loved to fight at least once with this mythical man, though Rick thinks such a duel might have brought about the end of the entire kingdom. Rionette observes that this type of combat as entertainment still thrives today as a central part of this place's tradition which Rick understands since the occupation of a fighter in Herectopia is extremely common. They even have a special name for those who battle in these events, they are called pugilists. With that said, the group sets off in search of the jewel they came for. Despite being a city accustomed to brutes walking on every corner, one of the inhabitants is startled when a gigantic orc approaches him on the street. Rick just wanted some information, but the man runs away in fear. Figuring he won't make any progress there, Rick suggests they look for information about the six jewels at the town hall. However, the scream of a defenseless girl catches the group's attention, and they see a beast woman being harassed by a man. Bruffston approaches to ask a question, but the man takes offense at the orc's presence warning that he is a pugilist, and therefore unafraid of trouble. Bruffston doesn't seem intimidated, and even comments that the bald guy doesn't look very strong, enraging the man further, who then challenges the orc to a fight in a nearby alley. In a matter of seconds, Bruffston beats the man who now agrees to answer their questions. He introduces himself as Gold, while the cat girl is named Militia. Getting straight to the point, the wise beast shows the crimson flower to the locals, and asks if they have seen anything similar around. Both feel they have seen something like it somewhere nearby, although they don't know exactly where. Behind the group, a crowd gathers to witness the opening show of the King of Fists tournament. Gold gets excited and reveals that this is the announcement parade for the city's tournament where the winner becomes the champion of the pugilists and the cat girl can't wait for these two months leading up to the event to pass quickly. This festival is so important that around five zezenzenzen people come to Herectopia every year to watch. Cheered by the crowd, they see a pugilist named Kerwin Orwolf who has won the King of Fists tournament five times three of them consecutively. Admiring the fighter being carried by an elephant through the crowd gold dreams of reaching that level one day. Speaking 
leading of a gleaming spherical jewel militia notices that Kerwin's champion belt bears a relic identical to the one sought by the foreigners. Bruffston recognizes it as the Sovereign's Gold One of the Six Jewels. After the parade, the famous pugilist enters the academy where he trains and a man approaches Kerwin to thank him for the show. The fighter doesn't mind because he knows the importance of exciting people on the eve of the tournament. However, the man with the eye patch doesn't believe that Kerwin is doing very well, which the pugilist denies. At this point, the three members of the Orichalcum Fist enter the academy in search of the great champion. Even the feared fighter of Heractopia feels a chill when faced with the enormous orc. Rick was trying to be discreet as he would inevitably have to broach a delicate subject. But that's not Bruffston's style who knows it's also not the pugilist's style to beat around the bush. So the orc gets straight to the point and reveals that the jewel on Kerwin's belt belonged to a member of Bruffston's group a long time ago. If the champion hands over the relic, the orc guarantees to return a jewel of equivalent value. The eye patch man is offended by the visitor's stance and calls someone to expel the group, but the pugilist asks his boss to calm down saying he can smell a liar which is not the case with these three strangers. However, he refuses to hand over the jewel because this belt is special to the people of Heractopia and is part of the pride of this country. In other words, the only way to access the belt is by winning the King of Fists tournament. Bruffston understands the circumstances and apologizes for the inconvenience, while Rick questions if they're just going to leave it at that following the leader of the Orichalcum Fist out of the academy. The eye patch man thinks they should teach these presumptuous foreigners a lesson, but Kerwin is sure the two would be dead if things came to a head against those three. After all, the pugilist noticed the intimidating presence of the maid and is sure she possesses surprising abilities. As for the man despite appearing normal, he seems to have trained his body to an extraordinary degree and has an aura that's hard to comprehend. Lastly, Kerwin knows that the orc carries absolute power within him. Outside, Bruffston reveals the plan to become a pugilist to win the event and earn the belt. To enter the tournament, one must pass the preliminaries held in the east and west of the kingdom and progress through the rounds until winning the block where everyone is also qualified. After that, the winners move on to the tournament's round of 16. Bruffston leaves Rick with the Western League while he heads to the East, and to avoid getting lost in this unfamiliar place, the Orc has arranged for a personal guide, a man named Gold. Then Rionette informs Rick that he needs to pass a test to earn the right to be a pugilist. She takes him to a simulated battle, where his opponent will be chosen randomly from the new competitors. Rick asks if his opponent is strong, and the organizer tells him it's a promising newcomer who won all the preliminary matches in the tournament. However, even if Rick loses, he can still qualify if he demonstrates a certain level of skill. Suddenly, Rick's rival introduces herself as Flash, and he immediately recognizes the voice. It was Angelica Diamuet, the spoiled noble he had defeated, causing all that trouble with the Diamuet family. However, it's Angelica who panics upon realizing her opponent is Rick Gladiator. In the audience, two old men watch the simulated battle alongside a few other men as Angelica's beauty tends to attract male attention wherever she goes. Although she quickly gained fame for her meteoric rise through the preliminaries, one of the old men warns against underestimating the other newcomer, noting that upsets happen in the tournament from time to time. In the ring Rick asks if her older brother is also in town, but she tells him she came alone which eases his mind. On the other hand Angelica is tense facing the man who defeated her without breaking a sweat. Even though she doesn't need to win to advance, she doesn't want to lose this fight. Soon her strength would be tested again as the organizer starts the test. Once again Angelica doesn't perceive Rick as threatening, but she remembers how she underestimated him last time and vows to keep her guard up at all times. She tries to use her instant step ability, but ends up stumbling and failing much to her surprise. Embarrassed, she stands up and tries again only to discover she didn't trip after all. In reality Rick was tripping her some somehow imperceptible to the eye. He asks if she enjoyed the skill he learned recently. According to him, this is the first of the eight secrets of taking it easy. The leg sweep, it's a technique designed to demoralize the opponent by not letting them stay on their feet. Essentially Rick was kicking her legs out from under her so quickly that even she a second class knight couldn't see it. Trying to maintain her dignity, she attempts to keep her distance, but it's futile. As she backs away, she's swept off her feet again, landing awkwardly on the battlefield. Field. As he continued to sweep her every time she stood up Rick seemed to feel guilty about how easy the fight was and praised the difficulty of timing the sweeps given flash
Flash's incredible speed, he encourages her to stay in the fight promising to go all out now, but Angelica raises her hands and surrenders immediately. Thus Gladiator earns his permission to compete after sweeping a noblewoman five times. However, she doesn't take kindly to her new humiliation by someone she considers an old man. Rick corrects her again explaining he's only in his early 30s. Angelica now crying asks how many times she has to be humiliated by him before he's satisfied. Rick hurriedly explains she's misinterpreting the situation desperate to change the subject. He invites Flash to grab something to eat. By coincidence they end up at an inn managed by Militia and her parents. After serving some snacks at the pugilist's table the cat girl asks where Bruffston is looking sad when she hears the orc is participating in the eastern preliminaries. When the waitress leaves Angelica asks Rick why he became a pugilist and he reveals his goal is to win the King of Fists tournament. The girl finds his ambition offensive but is too humble to protest. Nonetheless she informs him it's impossible for him to compete this year explaining that reaching the round of 16 is a long journey with insufficient time left. For instance only those who won 40 matches in the semester gain access to the league and the maximum a fighter can achieve is 10 matches per month. With only a week left before the tournament begins she deems it impossible for Gladiator to make it. However despite her lecture Rionette announces she has scheduled Rick's 40 matches within a four-day period leaving Flash speechless. Later Rick heads to his debut fight in the preliminaries and learns his opponent will be Grit Albert. The worried organizer explains that this competitor is known for breaking tournament rules by using a weapon although no body check has ever confirmed this. Soon Rick faces the scoundrel in the battlefield, but the man appears unarmed. In his mind Albert sees Gladiator as an old man who gave his all to become a pugilist at this age, and he intends to crush him to make it worthwhile. To achieve this Albert uses an impact stone in his shoe, increasing his strike force by up to 30 times. As the fight begins Albert throws his jacket over Rick's face to obscure his vision and punches him with all his might in the chest. After the insane impact he believes he has shattered his rival, but it turns out Albert's hand is the one completely broken. With this the impact stone falls from his hand revealing his trick. Rick mocks his opponent suggesting he should strengthen his body before delivering such a powerful blow with that item despite Albert recalling he shattered mountains with his fist. Nevertheless it's time for Rick's counterattack. He prepares the second of the eight secrets of taking it easy. With a punch that doesn't land on the opponent, the wind falls formed around Gladiator's fist shakes Albert's brain until he's unconscious. With this incredible victory, the old man watching the preliminaries realizes Kerwin Orwolf finally has a worthy opponent. As night falls in a shady establishment in Heroctopia, a monster named Jeeth sleeps soundly among beautiful girls until someone knocks on his door announcing it's time to work. The following day Angelica Diamuet took advantage of not being around Rick and dominated her rivals in the preliminary eliminations of the tournament. With 40 consecutive victories the Lampijo secured her spot and was already thinking about winning the block league matches just as Rick was getting excited to give his best. Angelica raised an eyebrow questioning whether the guy really intended to fight 40 times in 4 days since each venue only hosts one fight per day meaning he would have to travel hundreds of miles to dozens of areas where the fights take place to meet that quota. But before Lampijo could even finish her thought Rionette lost patience and called Rick to start the marathon as they had a fight at Green Hill Arena scheduled for 10 am. Angelica freaked out shouting that the arena was 30 miles away and that not even a souped up carriage would get them there in time. Offended Gladiator responded that he was in too much of a hurry to catch a carriage which is why he planned to run there instead. In no time he sped off at the speed of sound showing Diamuet that the true Lampijo in the room had just left. While she struggled to accept that the guy defied all the laws of physics Annette asked if Angelica was interested in watching Rick's fight. Angelica would love to see it but had no idea how she'd get there in time, so the elf offered to take her in a way the human girl would never expect by jumping between the city's rooftops at a surreal speed carrying her in her arms. Upon reaching Green Hill Arena Rick was surprised to find Diamuet collapse 
collapsed in the backstage area. Despite being there, the girl hadn't managed to see the fight due to sheer panic. In any case, Rick felt somewhat relieved not to have an audience, especially since he'd made a serious mistake with the third of his eight secrets for taking it easy. He realized at that moment that this move needed some adjustments. Behind him, Rianette reminded him it was time for the next fight, and he quickly headed off to his new challenge. Angelica begged to stay at Green Hill, but the elf ignored her pleas and carried the girl in her arms. At Kolak Arena, the human member of the Orichalcum Fist tried to calibrate his abilities to avoid turning his opponents into mush while still securing his victories. Upon reaching Shutgad Arena, Rick circled his opponent and finished him off with a small tornado created by his movement. By the time he reached Latrina Arena, yet another victim had fallen before the 30-year-old uncle. After the Coliseum's Mad Dash Angelica could hardly believe that the guy had actually managed to achieve 40 victories in four days to pass the preliminaries. Sitting with the girl in a beautiful setting reminiscent of Venice Rionette informed her that it was time for the block leagues and Diamuet thanked the heavens that she wasn't in the same block as that guy. After all, she did plan to win the tournament but it seemed pretty difficult with Rick participating. Besides that the elf reminded her that Bruffston was on his way to the next round in the Eastern League, the S-rank orc who trained Gladiator. Upon hearing this news, it seemed like Angelica's hopes of winning the championship faded away completely. Rionette then mentioned that Rick had set off for the Tronia region, prompting the human to curse herself for not being surprised that the guy was simply walking the 600-mile round trip. Changing the subject, she commented that the elf might be uncomfortable with people seeing her so often alongside Rick, which could lead them to think the two were involved, but the maid didn't mind at all as she harbored great affection for the man. Embarrassed by the response, Angelica pretended it was no big deal. Out of nowhere, the establishment's manager appeared in a panic desperate because he didn't have enough part-time workers. He begged the two ladies for help in a rather unconventional way, his forehead speaking volumes. Meanwhile, the Orichalcum Fist's Bugs Bunny reached his destination and was approached by a strange figure who knew his name. It was the president of the Western League Management Committee, and his name was Snape Resurrect. Snape had heard about Gladiator's historic run through the eliminations and so he greeted the competitor. At that moment an assistant informed the president that Angelica Diamuet wasn't present prompting Snape to assume that nothing could be done about it. Rick was curious about the man's acquaintance with Angelica so Snape explained that they were quite close as despite being a mere merchant his relationship with the House of Diamuet had always been very good. Since Snape's handshake was quite firm Rick deduced that the man had once been a boxer to which he responded that he had competed 20 years ago but had only won a small competition. The sense of accomplishment and the roar of the crowd had been very gratifying, but he was forced to retire at the age of 23, making that victory both his first and last. Rick was intrigued by the story and wanted to know the reason for the retirement, but Snape had to leave. However, before getting into his carriage, he mentioned that his company had entered a competitor into this competition and asked Rick to tell Angelica not to overdo it in the tournament. After that gladiator entered militias in where she expressed concern about the man having spoken with the owner of the Dragonaut Company. After all Snape Resurrect might seem like a gentleman, but rumors indicated he had deep connections to the criminal underworld. Besides he was the main sponsor of this year's competition. Rick mentioned that the businessman had entered a competitor in the tournament, so the Beast Girl explained that this competitor was there to fill the sponsor's slot a spot reserved for the company that financed most of the event. Nearby two guys were chatting about the high level of this year's bunny girls, especially the newcomer the dark elf girl. Speaking of which Angelica gives her all alongside Rionette to play the role of the event's bunny girl. Enthusiastic Diamuet lifts everyone's spirits by taking bets on who the seven competitors will be in the King of Fists tournament. A colleague remarks that Angelica was born for this job which frustrates her since she's doing it against her will. Rionette chimes in saying she wishes the human had turned down the invitation, but Angelica couldn't bring herself to say no to a man with a bleeding forehead. Suddenly, a drunk man grabs a bunny girl's arm and chases her, and her friend away then heads over to Angelica to pester her. To make matters worse, he insults the girl saying she doesn't even have a decent figure so lightning decks the guy leaving him on the ground. Rick arrives at that moment and asks what she's doing in that outfit, but then Rionette shows up dressed as a bunny girl too catching the man's eye. Indignant Angelica questions why his reaction is so different all while smashing 
the drunk. As night falls, Kerwin Orwolf discusses with his master the crushing victory of Bruffston in the Eastern League preliminaries where the Orc won all 40 fights in just two days each by knockout with a single blow. Despite this, Kerwin also recalls that Gladiator had a similar performance so he's certain this year's championship will be great fun for him. Years ago, Orwolf's master followed a man through dirty ruined streets of some city until they reached the gate of a structure. Inside, they saw the beastman who would become the celebrated champion of the King of Fists tournament, stacking defeated men all around the place. The master asks if they're in the presence of the voracious wolf, which Kerwin confirms also wanting to know if the old man is from some gang looking to settle a score. But the master intends to recruit the fighter, inviting him to Herectopia where he'll find wealth and glory. Faced with such an irresistible offer, Kerwin made an expression his master hadn't seen in a long time one that was finally repeated when the beastman discovered he had two worthy rivals in the competition. The next day Rick and Rionette try to console Angelica after her stint as a bunny girl, but nothing they say seems to change Diamuet's furious demeanor. Gladiator then mentions he spoke with Snape Resurrect yesterday, but Angelica pretends not to know who that is. Later the group heads to the venue where the next phase begins where only one participant from each block qualifies for the final tournament. In the first fight of block, a Helen Thompson faces off against Angelica Diamuet. Angelica starts the match with her signature instant step, but her strong opponent seems to have sharp reflexes and blocks the attack. From the crowd, Rick comments that Diamuet seems tense and Rianette agrees. Even so, with great effort, the young Lightning manages to defeat Thompson and advances to the next stage. When it's Rick's turn, he uses the third step of the eight secrets to take it easy. As the hours pass, Gladiator and Angelica keep advancing, maintaining the same intensity until they reach the following rounds. Now only four fights remain, and neither can afford to lose if they want to make it to the eliminations. Diamuet doesn't slow down and surrounds Taylor Brids her next opponent with her well-known speed combining her water wall with Thunderbolt Arrow to win her matches, but this adversary escapes the tactic unscathed. Surprisingly, the big guy matches Lightning's speed and hits her with a powerful punch, ending the fight. After the defeat, Angelica is treated by a nurse. Waiting for the girl outside the room, Rick mentions that her opponent's defensive strength was immense, but even so she insisted on a strategy that visibly wore her down. Angelica loses her patience and storms off through the city until Rick convinces her to talk calmly. She then confesses that Snape Resurrect is her fiancé because he was the one who helped her when her parents died in an accident about a year ago. The children took over the management of the Diamuet lands, but the young one's inexperience led the house into serious financial trouble. That's when the family's stingy grandfather stepped in and made a deal with Snape. Eager to forge ties with nobility, Snape offered a truckload of money in exchange for marrying Angelica. With a slow mind, Rick finally realizes that the girl is engaged to the lizard man and goes crazy over it while she adds that she investigated the guy while trying to annul her engagement to him and discovered he would become the main sponsor of the event. She was about to finish her thought, but a commotion from a bar catches their attention. Inside, Taylor Brids tries to help a girl being attacked by a lizard man, but he's taken down with just one blow. After that, the lizard turns his fury on the girl demanding something in return for spilling his beer. Angelica steps in against the lizard even though she fears his strength. But just as the creature is about to punch, the human Rick shields his companion. At that moment, Snape appears and asks Jeeth, his competitor, to hold back until the tournament which the pugilist does by fleeing the bar. Rick asks who that was and Snape reveals it was Jeeth resurrect his younger brother, a brute who flies off the handle at anything. Since no one can stand the guy, he's become that cocky. That said, he shows he's happy Angelica is safe as his wife's well-being is his most precious treasure. As the businessman leaves, Rick questions the connection between the engagement and him being the tournament's main sponsor. Angelica explains that the money exchanged for the engagement was so much that after checking the assets of the Argonaut Company, she discovered they have almost nothing, and this tournament is Snape's chance to reclaim his fortune. In other words, the event is already rigged, so the lizard is using the sponsor's spot to manipulate the outcome, which is why Angelica is getting involved. She wants to win the tournament and ruin her fiancé's company. The problem is to do that she needs to defeat Jeeth, which seems impossible. Faced with the challenge Rick offers to train Angelica. The next day, the duo wastes no time getting to work 
work even though the task proves to be much more difficult than the girl initially imagined. Angelica with weights strapped all over her body each weighing 60 pounds is advised never to deactivate her body strengthening ability if she doesn't want to die. She demands a better explanation for this madness but Gladiator ignores her and takes off running a rope tied around both of their waists. He explains that by pulling her along he's forcing her to run faster and with more strength. In the midst of it all he begins correcting her first flawed movements teaching her that while she has acceleration her stride isn't stable enough. With her hair all disheveled she pleads with Rick to stop running and he jokes that it's the first time Angelica has called him by his name. With no energy to comment on it the Flash begs him to stop but he insists it's crucial to push past the limits we think we have reassuring her not to worry because only six hours remain until the end of today's training. Hours later she collapses face first into the ground exhausted. Gladiator remarks that this is just how tough training for a second class night is while Angelica thanks God she still has her legs. Rick recalls nearly losing consciousness when he underwent this training with Rionette mentioning he died three times just on the first day. Hearing this Angelica proudly declares she survived her first day without dying but Rick laughs reminding her that it's only lunchtime. On the fifth day of training she was enjoying her lunch on a warm sunny afternoon convinced she wouldn't be able to keep up this pace until the end. At least she was in a secluded spot savoring her meal where no one could bother her not even Rick. But just as she thinks this her teacher appears at the window having searched the entire kingdom for her. Frustrated Angelica complains it's been less Less than 15 minutes since she tried to hide. Rick takes the opportunity to have some tea while Angelica asks when he's going to stop drinking and start scolding her for running away. But Rick surprises her explaining that he understands her desire to flee in fact he himself ran away dozens of times during his two years of grueling training dying thousands of times in the process. In one of these memories Bruffston realizes his pupil has died and borrows some mana from a Lyserette to bring the human back to life. Faced with a confused Rick after dying yet again, the orc explains that the vampire mage has granted him the power to revive Rick up to 2,000 more times, so it's time to keep going at the same pace. With this memory in mind, Rick tells Angelica he's gotten used to dying. She's surprised he endured it for two years, and the pure truth is that he tried to give up many times, but Bruffston always said the right thing urging him to weigh his current suffering against the regret of giving up. With these words, Gladiator could see the scene deep within his heart. Angelica deduces that he chose to endure the current suffering which is true while Rick concludes that even if he had quit his master assured him he would watch him leave with a smile. For some reason those words made everything easier to bear. Hearing this Angelica confesses that she hates the customs of nobility, the pristine outfits, the manners, the heavy makeup, and the ridiculous dances. Despite learning all kinds of things she always loathed every part of those etiquette rules. That's why she decided to contribute to the House of Diamuet as a fighter. Her dream is to become the first special class knight so she believes her scales are also tipping towards current suffering. With her motivation renewed the famous Flash is reminded by her teacher that her fighting style is a modified version of the knight's sword technique making her more powerful with a sword in hand. Since the tournament rules require fighting without weapons Rick suggests she learn a technique to turn her own hand into a blade. For that he's brought in a special instructor Rionette. After the intense night training the tournament was in full swing leading to the final match between the C block leaders each with seven wins and one loss. Angelica Diamuet faces Silver Helgand with only the winner advancing to the next round. In the arena facing her opponent Angelica trembles with fury like a caged beast. The duo of elders who always observe the duels comment on the strange situation of Diamuet believing she's likely at a disadvantage against Silver. However as soon as the announcement signals the start of the fight Diamuet delivers such a powerful punch to her opponent that he flies against the wall with indescribable force ending the fight to the shock of everyone present. From the stands Rionette notices that the training paid off though Rick thinks the girl might have been a little unhinged by everything she went through. At the militia
Lucia Tavern after the victory Angelica reflects that for some reason the stares of the townspeople hurt her making her question if she did something wrong in the tournament. Rick responds that winning is what matters while Rionette warns that the people might be afraid of her. Alice and Mizet arrive at the tavern and the elf asks the dwarf elf what happened to the rumors that one of the six jewels is in the empire. Mizet replies that it led to nothing as there isn't a shred of truth in them. Militia comes to serve the newcomers and has to dodge the instant flirtations of the dwarf elf until Bruffston arrives guided by his loyal squire Gold. The cat girl blushes at the orc's arrival which infuriates Mizet. With the table set for a true feast, the wise beast announces that all that's left now is to win the tournament and receive one of the six gems. Alice would love to participate in the event but Rick shuts down the mage's enthusiasm fearing she might devastate the entire arena. The orc asks who the human at the table is so Angelica explains that she was trained by Rick and Rionette though many times she thought she was being tortured by the two rather than taught. Even so each member of the Orichalcum Fist assures her that the human's efforts will be rewarded. Thus the official start of the King of Fists tournament finally arrives where the pairs are announced after a random draw. In the first match we have Herman Mueller against Jeef resurrect the competitor entered by the event's sponsor the Dragonaut Company. In the second match Angelica Diamute faces Doug Heap. In the third showdown Rick Gladiator goes up against Selena Kine and Rick is relieved not to have to fight against his master. Speaking of whom the fifth match will be between Donnie Fisher and Bruffston Ashork. In the audience Gold asks Militia to stop giving his master those love-struck looks. The fourth and final match pits Eddie Grace against the three-time champion Kerwin Erwolf and the Beastman's master is confident that no matter who he faces Erwolf will walk away with the belt once again. With the pairs for the first round established Angelica tells Rick about the organization's scheme to implement their cheating plan. The Dragonaut Company manipulated the bracket to ensure that Jeef wouldn't face Kerwin or Bruffston until the final to impress the audience with their competitor's strength from the beginning. When it reaches the final stages with the odds at their highest Snape plans to make a very clever bet because if the lizard deliberately loses at this point the boss will rake in a fortune. That's why they gave Jeef the easiest path including facing Angelica if he makes it past this first round and her plan is to destroy the sponsor's plans by defeating their competitor in the second match. Rick asks what Diamuet would do if she doesn't face the lizard until the final, but she hasn't even considered that. After the bracket is divided Kerwin and his master meet Rick and Bruffston and the members of the Orichalcum Fist confidently declare that they will take the belt home and consequently the gem they came for. Unfazed, Orwolf's master recalls when his pupil was younger. Back then his academy had only managed to get one competitor to the fourth place in the tournament, so he put his new fighter up against this pugilist named Garen. On that occasion Kerwin took a beating, but the taste of defeat drove him to train until he reached his physical peak when the Beast Man made his name in Heractopia by winning three tournaments. Six years have passed since then, and now the pugilist faces the greatest challenge of his life. Soon the first round begins where Jeeth Resurrect faces Herman Mueller. The human lands several hits on the monster who feels nothing due to his above-average resistance. After missing a strike Jeeth even hears a taunt from his opponent, but as soon as Herman attacks again, the giant lizard lands an arm on the guy's face, taking him out in one shot. Rick finds this very strange because even though Jeeth is strong his movements are amateurish. Regardless Angelica reminds him that the fight's purpose of impressing the betters has had its effect. Next she enters the arena and finishes off Silver Helgand while Rick and Bruffston also advance without breaking a sweat. Now it's time for the final match of the first round with Eddie Grace against the current champion. The Orichalcum Fist watches the fight closely to understand the extent of Kerwin's strength which is demonstrated right from the first blow. Rick notes that Orwolf anticipated his opponent's move and Bruffston adds that the excellent sense of smell of a dogman provides this ability known as future scent. Despite the praises for the pugilist, the current champion takes a hard hit in the fight which Rionette claims was intentional. After taking the hit Kerwin gets up and knocks out his rival, and the audience relaxes after sweating bullets seeing their favorite fighter on the ropes. To his surprise Rick hears one of the champion's colleagues comment that he's too inconsistent. A day later the second round begins with the audience 
audience split between betting on Kerwin Orwolf and Jeeth resurrects. Snape approaches Rick and formally introduces himself to his companions so Alice comments that the lizard is overdoing it with this whole act which embarrasses the businessman. Mizet explains that adults have to pretend to be adults all the time and the vampire discovers that life for those who aren't children can be quite harsh. Rick asks why Snape isn't in the VIP seat and he explains that he wants to see the fight between his fiancé and his youngest up close. Speaking of them, the two meet before the match and Jeeth says his brother asked him not to mess up his future wife's face. Angelica is eager to show the results of her training while the lizard laughs about only spending his father's money on nonsense and still being stronger than his opponent. Since he brought it up Angelica claims it's impossible for Jeeth to have such a physique without training and he dodges responding that sometimes he's the guy people call a prodigy. Either way he promises not to crush his opponent so she can still carry Snape's children later. Offended by this insult Angelica vows to crush him. The clash between the two begins and Angelica starts with a flying kick to Jeeth's torso but he doesn't feel the impact. At least unlike Herman the Diamute Knight has the speed necessary to avoid taking hits. As she suspected her physical attacks don't work against the youngest resurrect so she cancels her enhancement magic leaving the entire audience baffled. Afterwards she uses magic flow reverse reflection and advances with instant step finishing with a new technique she learned thread cut where her hand simulates a sword and slices open Jeeth's belly. 